Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Don't look at the circumstance. One thing I'm learning about life is you have a choice. You can either be a spectator or a participator. Amen? And I remember um, when I used to, I ran a couple races when I was in college, not competitive, just to see if I could run t- six miles and three miles. But I noticed that I didn't really have any training or anything. I just ran up and down. I lived on the 11th floor of a, a dormitory, so I just would run the stairs up and down, up and down, then just run around. And then I never ran six days, I mean, six miles in my life at one time, but I uh, just would run a couple miles. And then when the race started, uh, you know, a lot of people took off real fast. And I mean, they were just, uh, you know, they was getting their pack and separating themselves and getting all this. You know, I, I just just enjoyed being in the, on the, you know, in the race. Amen. And, you know, free T-shirt, you know, thank, you know, all that stuff. Amen. And uh, I noticed we had like five miles left one time on this six-mile race, and I started running a little bit faster, and people were like, I, I could, you could tell just people were like, man, you got a long way to go. Why are you running fast now? Well, there was free refreshments right above, ahead of me, amen? <laughs> and um, so I would run up and get it, and then I would slow down, and i just run a little bit, and i see it again, and i start running again, grab it and drink it. You know, I really didn't care what anybody thought because they had to go and get their own and pay for it. Mine was already provided for because I was in the race. Yeah. See, when you are running your race for God and you're, you're a participator, everything that you need to refresh you, to revive you, and restore you, and to renew you is already provided. Even if you get hurt, they had a medical team there. I didn't even have to pay for it. Why? Because my little $10 entry fee or whatever caused me to be partakers of all the benefits that came with that race. If I won, I got a prize. If I didn't, I got some sorts of accomplishment, the free shirt or whatever. Amen? Amen. I don't know why they called it a free shirt. I think I paid for it anyway. Amen. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, is we're all running a race. But you got to ask yourself, am I a participator or a, part, a, a spectator? Because if you're a spectator, then you're going to have to go out and do your own thing and provide for it. Amen? So I found out it's better just to be part of the race. Now, here's the thing about God's race. You don't have to run anybody else's race but yours. But your race affects everybody else. Amen? As you are obedient, He brings you into people's lives as He's bringing them into your life. God does things in due season and due time. And when they do that, then you'll start to realize as you love God. How do you love God? One of the best examples in John 15, He says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In other words, you'll just... Simply obey what I say. That's why a lot of people get a misconception about um, um, sowing and reaping. You know, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. What that actually means, if you break it down, means if you will just simply take me at my word and just do what I say, there will not be one person to be able to stand up and mock me, your God, and say that I was not big enough to bring a harvest to your behalf personally. Amen? Amen. So if I really love God, I'm going to keep His word. And if, I love, if I'm going to keep His word, then I'm going to fulfill His purpose. See, that's why people don't... When you find your purpose, you almost find your passion because that's what drives you to fulfill the purpose. That's why you work 18 hours a day and you don't even think about why. Because you love what you do. Amen. The founder of Holiday Inn, I asked him what was the key to success. He said, I only work half days. He says, you choose what 12 hours of the day you want to work. He said, but I only work half a day. Amen? So what I'm saying is, is when you find your passion, it's a gift from God when you find out what you, you are doing. Amen? So when you love God or are called according to His purpose, what happens is, is whatever you do, you actually end up reaping because why? God always gives you the provision that you need along the course of life to meet all your needs. It's not that He just wants to meet your needs. He wants to give you what you want. Why? Because when you love God, all your heart, it's actually God giving you the desires. Are you all seeing this? It's not what you think you want. When you love God with all your heart, it's not what you want, it's what He wants, so He ends up giving you the desires. Are you seeing this? If you love God with all your heart, it's not what you want, it's what He wants, so He's giving you the desires of your heart. He knows what you need before you need it. And what you, what, you think what you're going to want is really going to make you happy. 
But when you really want what He wants, then He gives you what you want. Because it's a desire, and He says, I'll give you when I do. I'll bless you and add no sorrow to it. Can I give you the 21st century version of that? No 60 easy payments. Amen. Amen. A blessing should be a blessing. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to have payments. I'm just saying it's better when you don't. You know, when you get audited because you gave too much one year to your charitable contributions or whatever to this, I did. We got audited one year. And I'm telling you, it was three lists of 12 columns that they want. And, and the Lord, I heard the Lord say, watch what you say. Because, I mean, that thing that fearly, I feared greatly had almost come upon me. Amen. <laughs> but I looked closely and there was one little check mark out of those three columns. It says charitable, charitable contributions. I read the memo at the bottom. It said something like this. The degree of your percentage of your income based upon what you made versus what you gave is at a higher level than normal. I said, well, this is good. Because if the IRS is recognizing I'm giving too much according to their standards... I know if the IRS knows I'm giving too much, then the devil knows I'm giving too much because they work together sometimes, amen? It's, I mean, it's the internal revenue of Satan. That's what I call it, amen? Uh, no. But then it dawned on me that if, I, if, if God, if the devil knows I gave too much and the IRS has given, then God knows that I have given to where it's pleased him and made the devil mad, amen? I said, Wendy, this is good. We have gotten audited. Even the enemy has recognized our giving. I sent it all and they mailed me a letter back and they said, uh, thank you, disregard our last letter. What you have supplied has been sufficient evidence to settle or, or to close your case. I thought, well, praise God. When's the last time you gave so much that the enemy recognizes you're giving? Amen? Now, I'm not trying to get in pride or brag. All I'm saying is this. When you love God and called according to His purpose. Now, if I can tell you one thing, I'll tell you this this morning, besides God loves you. Is He does not want your opinion. If He did, He would have created man earlier than the sixth day. <laughs> So don't tell me what you think about tithes and offerings because you may say something that will show your ignorance. Amen? Come on, don't open your mouth and confirm it to everybody. Amen? If I could smile, I would. I have no lips. Amen? Uh, one day I was trying to describe that to somebody. I said, well, I have like Larry Bird lips. You ever seen the basketball player Larry Bird? He has no lips. Then it dawned on me, birds don't have lips anyway. Amen? <laughs> Love God and call according to His purpose. What does it say right before that? All things. What, how many does all include? All. It leaves out how many? None. All things work together for good to them that love God or are called according to His purpose. Now, if, if Pastor John came home one day and, and Pastor Karen was sitting there fixing a cake from scratch and he walks in and there's six bowls... So what are you doing? So why well, I'm baking you a cake, honey, this is because I love you and I just felt like I, you know you would enjoy it. So he reaches over and puts his finger in only one of the six bowls. Now does that one bowl represent all the cake? No, all six of them does. See, a lot of things that in your life that you think is trying to destroy you, God's actually using to bless you at the end. It's not where you're at, it's where you're going to end up. He said in Jeremiah 29, 11, I've given you good success in your final outcome. So just because you're going through something doesn't mean it's going to happen. I was at the airport the other day, going th yesterday morning, going through security, and I said, there's one thing I learned. I told this couple when we went through, I said, one thing I learned about life in airports, and they said, what? I said, if you praise, you'll be raised. But if you complain, you will remain. <laughs> now, you either sit in the airport for four hours in a little room, it's your flight. Or spiritually, you could be wandering in the desert for 40 years when it should only took you about three weeks. And you're wondering why your life is, has no... Are you hearing what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to encourage you to do is this. Really, God doesn't want our opinion. He just wants our obedience. He said, if you're willing and obedient, you should eat the good of the land. 
Obedience is an act of conduct. Willingness is an act of the submission of the heart. It's not a have-to gospel. It's a get-to gospel. Amen. See, I don't give offerings, and I don't pay my tithes. I really don't call it paying tithes anymore. I give it tithes. Paying tithes, to me, is what you put between the electric bill and the gas bill. It's not my utilities. It's a holy form of worship that I set aside. And I, the, my wife, Actually, I pay all the bills, and my wife gives the offerings or the tithes. Because she has a mindset of where she gives of the off. I don't want her to think that she's paying another bill. I pay the bills. She gives the tithes and offerings. You see what I'm saying? I don't want her just writing one check after another. You do that. I'm going to do this. Because I'm used to paying things. She's used to giving things. So she represents us as one flesh. So when I give my offerings or do sowing and reaping, or when I confess, I'm not trying to get God to do something. Yeah. Romans 5.2 says we access the grace of God through faith. Well, what's the word access? Well, it means admittance. You ever get a ticket? It says the price of admission, and then you pay the price. They give you a ticket of what? Admission or accessibility into what's already provided for. So I don't really try to give my tithes and offerings to get God to give me something. I do it because I believe he's already done it, so I believe it. Why do I confess something? I don't confess to get God to do it. I confess God because I believe he's already done it, because I believe, therefore I speak. I'll give you one more thing before we go on. The Lord told me a while back, he said, a lot of my people, I believe he said this, he said, a lot of my people are living off the reaction instead of the action. He says they're wanting to receive something they never asked for. They're trying to knock, uh, have a door open that they've never knocked on, and they're trying to find something they're not even seeking after. He says they want me to draw nigh to them, but they haven't even drawn nigh to me. He said they're resisting the devil, but they forgot to submit to me. The best way to receive something from God is by what? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. When you draw nigh to me... Then I'll draw nigh to you. What's the best way to resist the devil? Number one way. What's it? It's in the same passage of Scripture right before. Resist the devil and he shall flee. Submit yourself therefore unto God. So the devil's not your problem. Your problem is the situation. Well, actually, you don't have problems. You got answers. The problem is you don't apply the answer to solve the problem. That's the problem. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge just because you got the merit badge on your Holy Ghost ass. Oh, Pastor John's already preached on faith three times this month or this year. Pastor Karen's already preached on prayer. I don't care. You got the merit badge, but faith doesn't come by having heard. Amen. Somebody asked me one day, they said, well, how can you justify preaching the same messages over and over sometimes? And do that? I said, well, Brother Hagin preached on faith for 60-some years. And then all of a sudden I heard, I just said this. You know, the recipe for bread is thousands of years old, but the key is to bake it fresh every day. Amen. 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 If you got your Bibles, turn wherever you want. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> turn to Proverbs chapter 23. Pastor John's right. I preach fast. I preach what they call trash compactor messages. You know, the, you know my, I don't know why, but I, my mind just thinks real funny. I got to, people say, well, I don't have nobody to witness to. You know who I started witnessing to? All my trash men. And one of them, actually, I found out was born again. And you know when I'm gone, my trash cans on all the entire street in my area, mines are only ones that the guys put up next to my, in my garage or next up to my garage door. You know why? I leave them water, Gatorade, and cookies right on the top. When I'm there, you know, I, when I come back home, I, and one of them said, can you pray for me? I said, I sure will. I started laughing when I left. I said, God, you're even teaching me how to Holy Ghost trash talk. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I'm talking trash with my friend. I'm spreading to God. I'm just trashing my neighborhood. Amen. <laughs> People said, can you trash talk? I said, you have no idea. <laughs> come on now. No, I'm serious. Cycle guys come by. I just give them stuff. I just want, I, you know what? Each one reach one. One waters, one plants, but God gives the increase. Amen? You may never know who you're reaching. They asked Billy Graham, who was one of the most influential people in his life, and he said, he almost instantly said, oh, that's sister so-and-so. And they could not find out that she was a great revivalist, a pastor, missionary. They said, well, 
Dr. Grant, we don't even know who this lady is. We, we can't find her. Well, she's not pastor. She's not a missionary. She's not a revivalist. I mean, why? he said, well, she was my Sunday school teacher. She was a retired school teacher after so many decades of teaching. And they needed somebody to take a small class of boys in this one little church. And I guess nobody would do it. But he said, I'll do it. And think about that. One of them sitting in that room was Billy Graham, who is accredited to 40 to 60 million souls upon the planet that are going to heaven. And thank God, some Sunday school teacher that was retired school teacher said, I will do it. Now, don't you think God's going to look at her and say, yeah, I really appreciate what you did. And everybody's always wanting to get two people on their downline to the right and on the, to the left, but they just won't go out and witness to anybody on their right or on their left. Listen, there's another system besides multi-level marketing. It's just in, in winning, making disciples, amen? Praise the Lord. I smile, but I have no lips. Now, I touched on this. As they say back in Kentucky, I tapped that dancing around a little bit, but I never really got into it. But I want to talk about living in the realm of God today. And Pastor John said it, I preach fast, so you'll have to listen fast. There's three things I want to talk about today. Thinking, believing, and speaking. Brother Hagin said this in one of his books, they must be synchronized with the Word of God. You got to get your thinking, number one, believing, number two, and your speaking must be synchronized with the Word of God. The word synchronized means to agree in time or to be sim simultaneous. Simultaneous. It means, I can't pronounce it. It's just Pastor Michael always thinks I talk funny, but praise the Lord. Amen. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than y'all. I think that's funny, but it's powerful. Amen. No, I'm just, no, I'm just giving you a hard time. Synchronized. To agree in time, to be simultaneous. Now, uh, synchronization means the coordination of events to operate a system in unison. Synchronization means to co the coordination of events to operate a system in unison. What does simultaneous mean? We just mentioned that. I know I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Existing or happening at the same time. Existing or happening at the same time as a simultaneous, simultaneous event. So what's the word unison mean? Unison means in agreement or in harmony. In other words, you've got to get your thinking, believing, and speaking in agreement or in harmony in order to really have days of heaven up on earth, to receive what you need. Because as, a, as you know, as a, a double-minded man, we're going to cover this later, is unstable in all his ways. Let not this man think, he shall receive anything of the Lord. The Lord is not withholding any good thing from those that love him. Amen? So if... Now, I want to say, read this twice, so if you want to write it down, if not, get the tape. If your thinking is wrong, then your believing is going to be wrong. If your believing is wrong, then your talking is going to be wrong. You have to get all three of these areas synchronized with the Word of God. If your thinking is wrong, then your believing is going to be wrong. And if your believing is wrong, then your talking is going to be wrong. You have to get all three areas of your life synchronized with the Word of God. In other words, you can, have the most power, you can have the most purest seeds. And when your pastors or whoever they are come and minister to you, the Bible calls this, in Luke 8, the seed, which is the Word of God. This is an invaluable seed. So let's take it from the spiritual to the natural, but they're both parallel. You can have seeds that are worth a million dollars apiece. You will not put those in a Tupperware bag and leave them out in the car. No, you will find one of those little things where they put those expensive cigars in and make sure it's room temperature. I mean, you know, it's got the humidity just right and everything, the pressure. Why? Because million-dollar seeds have million-dollar seeds inside of them. See, but we think different than God. A lot of times, I like what uh, one gentleman said. He said, a lot of times we as individuals can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in the seed. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So a lot of times we got to change the way we think and stuff because if we don't, then what's going to happen is, is we're going to take what was given to us, the incorruptible, the pure, and most valuable seed. If you had that in the natural, if it was a million dollar seed and you had five of them, or let's say seven, seven million dollars of seeds right there. How many think if you had million dollar seeds, you would find the richest soil you could find regardless of the price? Because why? That is what's going to produce more million dollar seeds. Amen. You would find the most purest water that you could with rich. 
And guess what happens? Then what happens is you would plant that in the best soil, water it with the best water, in the best conditions, and you would start to produce the plants that would produce more million dollar seeds. But unfortunately what we in the natural and as well as in the spiritual is we take the most purest seed which is the word of God which has no price value upon it because it, you can't even put a price on it. It's priceless. But what we do is God says I want to choose to put my word down inside of you. And I want you to make sure the soil of your heart stays pure. You better make sure what you believe is pure. And then I want you to water it with the words of your mouth, John 15, 2, by the washing of the water of the word. So what you say and what you believe is the soil and the water of what you think. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7, it says that. Let's read it again. For as he thinks, what's the word? In, I-N, his heart, so is he. You ever know sometimes what comes in must come out? If you throw something in a trash can, you, you, you think, oh, I made a mistake. Then you're going to have to bring it out. See, what goes in you is eventually going to come out of you. That's right. yeah. That's true. You want me to show you what it says? Let me show you. It says in Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. John 7, 38, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 4. I'm going to show you a passage here that's going to really... Show you something. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Look at verse 18 through 23. But the path of the uncompromising just and righteous is like the dawn, uh, light of dawn that shines more and more and brighter and clearer until it reaches its full strength and glory in the perfect to pre be prepared day. Verse 19. The way of the wicked is as deep darkness and they do not know what they stumble. Verse 20 through 23. My son, attend to my words, consent and submit to my sayings. Let them not depart from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart, for they are life unto those who find them, and healing and flesh to I mean healing and health to all their flesh. All their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard, for out of it flows the springs of life. Now, when I went over here to the King James, I mean the King James Version, verse 20 has one key word. Watch this. Hear, verse 21, eyes and heart. Verse 22, flesh. Verse 23, heart. Verse 24, mouth. So what happens is this. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, life and death is in the power of the what? Tongue. Tongue. So what I'm finding out is this. It starts with your thinking. It drops to your heart. You're believing. And when you believe it long enough through meditation or whatever or impartation, what happens is it, it starts to germination. It starts to germinate. It's a root. See, you know, a seed in the ground for a day is not going to grow. But, you know, it's amazing if you put your hand in there, it'll start to wrinkle and shrink up and do something. Why? Because that purpose of that ground is to grow stuff. It's trying to cause your hand to do something, but your hand is not there to produce. But when you get a seed in there and leave it in there long enough and meditate upon it and water it, it will germinate and get a root system. That's why he talks about don't let the root of bitterness get inside of you. That's why he talks about casting down certain things. And we're going to get into that. So if you have your Bibles now, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, verse 4 and 5. Now I want to bring out, some of these are going to overlap and they're going to go pretty fast because after we get done with the thinking part, you're going to see that it overlaps into the believing and that absolutely, completely almost consumes the speaking. Because, you know, we know in the scriptures, I believe, therefore I speak. Amen. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 3, 4, and 5. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pouring down of strongholds, casting down, watch this, imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the what? 
obedience of God. Now, you know, we went through all these teachings years ago. I remember Brother Hagin, the first time I ever heard Brother Hagin on the campus of Rhema Bible Training Center was in the Nanowski Recreation Center. He was doing a winter Bible seminar. It was in February of 1990. I ended up going to school there, starting school in September of 90. But he's talking about this. He said, I've seen this come around three or four times about Catholic strongholds, people getting on planes, going around cities and different things like that, going to the top of the mountain, all this. But he said one phrase that put it all in perspective. He said, how can you pull down something you're seated above? What he's talking about is your mind. Now, he didn't deny there was principalities and powers and different things over certain cities. You know, I'm not against anybody. I mean, but, you know, when you think of San Francisco, you think of the 49ers or the Giants. Or you think of homosexuality. I'm being honest. When you, when you think of Las Vegas, what do you think of? Gambling. Gambling. All these different things like that. You know, shows or whatever. Sin City. Atlantic City. When you think of certain things. When, whenever I preach in certain areas, I've noticed that there's a certain type of uh, influence. Why? Because you've got so many people thinking, believing, and speaking the same thing. So what happened in the book of Acts when everybody started to think, believe, and speak the same thing? When they got in one mind and one accord, what happened? Suddenly, the Holy Spirit fell. And what was the first thing he did that is evidence? They all spoke with other tongues. But where did it start? They got in one accord and one mind. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, but out of the bunch of heart, the mouth speaks, life and death is in the power of the tongue. Words create images which affect your imagine, or I call it, I create a new word, an imagination. Because <laughs> words create images. Amen? I'll give, I'll give you an example. I can say one, one sentence in every word will almost add a new dimension but it will always be different than what your neighbor sees because you might have a dog that's like this. See, you immediately thought of a dog. Yeah. A big black Labrador retriever with a red bow around his neck with his tongue sticking out running straight towards you. <laughs> I could say one, one character, cartoon character. Now, all of a sudden, you, everybody's got a cartoon character. Now, I have to just say a couple more words to narrow that image down to where we all get in one mind. It might not be the exact same image, but it's going to get us in the same mindset. Garfield the cat. Everybody's got their own image of Garfield. Some are thinking of lasagna right now. Some are thinking about the dog. Some are thinking about him sleeping. Some are about thinking about him eating pizza. Some of him thinking about with John. Some of him, are you hearing what I'm saying? But we're all thinking about one cat right now, and his name is what? See, you just thought the same thing because of my words have created an image that got into your heart. And guess what? We all said it without me prompting. I just said we're thinking about the same what? Cat. I didn't say the name, but everybody said it in unison. The reason I'm preaching this message, I believe one reason is this. We've got to get synchronized and we've got to get in one accord. We've got to get recalibrated. Recal we've got to recalculate our individual lives because I believe for God, what he wants to do upon the earth, he said, I will come to you again as the former and the latter rain. And if the former rain was in one mind and one accord, speaking and doing the same thing, they all had thing all things as common, but they turned the world upside down. I thought, we have got to go back and recalculate. You know, today they asked me in the hotel. It's a very nice place. I, I mean, they're always good. And, I, I, and I've been working out and doing different things and all this for the last seven months. I showed Michael today. I said, look at this. This suit used to be so tight. I said, look at it now. Amen. 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 So I'm changing my ministry name to Half the Man Ministry in full time. <laughs> my trainer said, what do you want? What's your goal? I said, I just get to the place to where I have to jump around the shower to get wet. No, I'm just teasing. That's a bad image right there. I'm sorry. I went out. Everybody's like, oh, I got to get it on my mind right now. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, 4, and 5. Let's read it again. For the way we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the point down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the what? Obedience, Obedience of Christ. Okay, let me read these notes. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. War after the flesh. What does that really mean? Paul often used a military metaphor to describe the Christian life 
in this verse. Flesh is not used theologically, but actually physiologically, as actual flesh. Referred to our human, our natural human abilities. We walk, quote, walk like all natural men physically, but our warfare is conducted in the realm of the spirit, not with swords or guns. Verse 4, not carnal. What does this mean? Our weapons are not fleshly weapons, but spiritual. In fact, Paul enumerates them in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 18, called the whole armor of God. Namely, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the word of God and prayer. Pastor John mentioned that right before I came up. Now watch this. It says, and he says this, verse 5, imaginations. The spiritual, watch this, the spiritual weapons ordained by God may not appear impressive outwardly to a humanistic oriented society. But it is only those that can pull down the strongholds of Satan in the world, educational and political systems. Otherwise, the enemy will, quote, spoil us, that S-P-O-I-L, now watch this, that is, defeat us and despoils of, of us of the carnal weapons that we have tried to use to him, example, in Colossians 2, 8. What does it mean in verse 5 about every thought? The thought here is in the same word as mind. Now watch this. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God in Ephesians 6, 17, will result in the opening of the blinded minds, which are in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, of those who have rejected God and His Word and capturing them for Christ. Thus, we are not to use carnal weapons as bullets or even ballots in our battle for the human mind, but the mighty spiritual weapons in the whole armor of God. In other words, Light exposes darkness. Amen. The definition of darkness is the absence of light. I guarantee it tonight at 740. here in Madeira. You're going to see all of a sudden a sneak attack of darkness upon light. The reason darkness comes is light yields. Everybody say yields. Light yields to allow the darkness to come in. Listen, whatever you yield to, you become filled with. Did you hear me? Whatever you yield to, you become filled with. It starts with your mind. What do you allow your mind to think upon? It all starts with a mindset. I shared the story about my cousin. She went from 382 pounds to 140 in 17 months. No surgery, no diet. A doctor simply wrote down four little things to do. She did them. And uh, the biggest thing was this. Number one was eat eight ounces. I'm not endorsing this. I'm just saying this is what she did, and she looks fantastic. Eat eight ounces every three hours. Don't skip a meal, number two. No sugar drinks, number three. And number four was the one that really got me. He said, whatever you do, don't tell nobody what you're doing. And I said, why? She said, because there's too many voices out there. And words create images, and you'll get so confused in your head of what to do, you'll end up doing nothing. One of the things they said in, in, in real estate, when I used to attend real estate courses, because we were thinking about flipping, we did a couple houses and stuff years ago, but they said, I, a guy stood up and said, let me tell you something right now. We're going to sit here, and I think it was a gentleman, he said, we're going to tell you the methods, show you the principles, show you all the different things you need to do, give you the equipment, and we are going to equip you, and when you go out there, you're going to do everything we say, and you're going to run it, and everything's going to say, buy this house, it will make you money, or buy this property, it's a good investment, or whatever. And you'll sit there and you'll run it again, and you'll run it again, you'll run it again, and you'll think about it, you'll do it again, you'll think about it, you'll do it, and somebody will come in and buy it, or the price will go up, and you'll lose the whole deal. Here's the phrase he used. Analysis brings paralysis. The Bible says in James 1.22, be a doer of the word, not hearer only, comma, deceiving your own selves. So when I look it up, it actually means it. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, comma, with reasonings that are contradictive to the truth. If one thing I can tell you is this, I, I went back and I already told you, God does not want your opinion. But the moment you sit back and analyze the word of God and try to get, are you all hearing me? Yeah. When you try to get the word of God to fit your lifestyle, yeah. that's the moment you've deceived yourself. You do not come to the word of God and pick and parry uh, cherry pick what you feel and what you think. Well, I think if God loves you, no, sorry, God does not want your opinion. He wants your willingness and your obedience. He says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Can I tell you what that? You'll fly in the good of the land, sleep in the good of the land, wear the good of the land, and drive the good of the land. You, your enemies will even call you blessed. Why? Because when your ways please God, He'll even make 
enemies to be at peace with you. So don't sit back and cherry pick what you think and what you... You know, my older sister, which I highly respect, she's in heaven now, much older than I was, but she would come in and she said, yeah, but it's said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I said, but sister, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 6 and I'll read you what the word actually says about it. She got real quiet. I said... You have heard it's been said, an eye for an eye, two, two. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those that persecute you and decisively use you. And I went out, she said, that's in the Bible? I said, yes, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You cannot believe past what you don't know. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sometimes you've got to speak the truth in love. Don't be arrogant, don't be forceful. Firm but gentle. Speak the truth with love. One of the most powerful things you can do to the devil and to people in your life that are bad influences in association with you is learn to say no without feeling guilty about it. What do you mean? Well, no means no. I appreciate it, but no thank you. People come up to me on my door, no thank you. Well, I, I said, listen, we can sit here and waste your time because it's going to get dark soon, but the answer is still going to be no. I'm not trying to be rude. I've already got what I need, and I appreciate you coming by. You want a bottle of water? I'll give you some cookies like I give to the trash guys. Amen? <laughs> but, I, but what I'm saying is I, the answer is no. Right. I set the limits of what people can do to me. Come on. Now, there's certain things as long uh, the laws of the land. See, I'm trying to look this up and I have not found it yet, but I think the original Bill of Rights was called the Bill of Righteousness. You know, we have certain rights as citizens of the United States. When I was in Greece last year, we was driving through Athens to go preach, and when, before we got to where we were staying, they said, right, there's the American Embassy. Why? See, I'm in that country, but I'm not of that country. When I go over there, I'm not an American, spiritually. I'm, just, I'm a sent one. I'm an ambassador. Yeah. Are you all hear what I'm saying? Yeah. But as on the natural perspective, that is my safe place right there. Because that is legally, that's American soil per se. Yeah. That I have refuge in there. Yeah. So people go, well, what do you do when you're in trouble and things happen? I, I've learned just say, Jesus. Jesus, why? The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous runneth into it and is safe. Amen? See, how do you get to that place? How do you automatically just say something because it comes out of your heart? But how did it get in your heart? Because you first heard it and in thought and it went down. See, it's not enough for your pastors to come and preach to you about healing and salvation and deliverance and prayer and how to do things. you got to meditate upon that. Just because you have food in front of you and there's a buffet that's been prepared, they can't put that in your mouth and chew it for you and make you swallow it. you got to get it in there and put it before you. That's why he said over here, set the word of God before you. you got to put a guard about your lips and you got to keep peace. Well, I have a lot of issues. Well, we all got issues. That's why the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the Issues of life. Do you want good issues or do you want bad issues? People say, well, I just got issues. I said, well, what are you watching on TV? Jerry Springer? That's a lot of issues right there. Amen. <laughs> Come on now. Are you watching some Bible studies or something? Are you watching something that is giving you some good issues? Amen. We had an old saying in the county when I was in college. They said, garbage in, garbage out. Come on, folks. You can't sit there and just, you know, my, one thing I've learned about training, it's not what you exert, it's what you swallow as food. Amen? I had to eat the right things to produce the right results. I had to change my mindset. That's what my cousin said that lost all that weight. What was the biggest thing you had to do? She said, I had to change my mindset. And then I really believed it. And then I started talking and walking it out. Yeah. Hearing what I'm saying. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. We're still talking about the mind, but we're overlapping with the believing and the speaking. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, what happens at the moment you get born again? Listen, it's like my cousin, bless his heart, one time I remember when I was just a kid in the 80s, he got up and gave the altar call, and he said, I'm telling you, if you're rich, God wants you to come down here. It doesn't matter if you're poor. He wants you to come down here and get saved. He said, I don't care if you drive this nice car or you walk. God wants you to come down here to get saved. 
If that's you, I want you to come down here right now. Remember, I, I can tell you almost where I was sitting. This is where he blew it. He said, if you're good looking, I want you to come down here. I'll tell you what, if you're ugly, I want you to come down here right now. I just put my head down. I said, the devil wouldn't even come down for this altar call. <laughs> so what, when you get born again, what happens? You know, people say, well, am I completely changed? Not really. If you had a little mole right here in the, floor, in the middle of your forehead, you still got that little mole right there after you got it. Amen? Right. See, one thing a lot of people think God does is this. You know, I'm going to get my age. I, I guess today they're CDs or MP3 players. I'm probably behind on that. Amen? I mean, when I first got married, my wife was just teasing me that she said, listen, I love you, but I'm tired every morning waking up and cleaning the white out off the screen. Amen? <laughs> then she really hurt my feelings when she made me take my cup out of the cup holder and put a floppy disk in there. Amen? <laughs> I'm just trying to keep you all awake, amen? Some of them are like, I have no clue what he's talking about, but I'm going to laugh anyway. I forgot my point now. Oh, no, that was it. Praise the Lord. All right, I, I had it. Oh, now listen, after you get saved, let me, let me say this. After you get born again, you know, this is what God does. You know, like, you know how they had the old cassettes and you had a sermon, you go, oh man, I really got to get a copy of this. They would have the tape that was called the what? Master, Master tape. And then they made what off of that? Duplicates. Duplicates. When you get born again, God doesn't do that. He takes your tape and just throws it away. And he makes one that is inseparable from the master. Mm -hmm. If you put them down, you go, oh, I don't know which one's the master. Because you're created in His image and after His likeness. You're born again. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. So what happens is you are created now in the image. But what happens after that? Well, you'll probably still think the same way and look the same way. And act the same way. That's why Paul wrote this letter. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. This is, the thing. This is affecting your thinking, believing, and speaking. All right? I appeal to you, their brethren, and beg of you in the view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your what? Bodies. Presenting all your members and faculties, watch this, as a living sacrifice, holy and devoted and consecrated, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligible service and spiritual worship. Do you know by you choosing to get up this morning, driving or however you got here, coming and sitting down in these chairs, you have just showed God I'm offering my body up as a spiritual worship to you right now. I'll ask you a simple question to prove my fact or truth. How many came here this morning without your bodies? She needs another Starbucks, I can tell right now. How many like Starbucks in here? How many of you heard in, in a coffee shop, or when I say Starbucks, just coffee, how many of you... Um, I hear people complaining about the price of a gallon of gas while you're in a coffee shop. You want me to tell you why you don't? If you do, next time you do this, say, do you know you're paying 70-some dollars a gallon for that coffee? And you're complaining about $3 gas. It's how you think. Amen? People go, I can't stop drinking coffee. I say, I'll give you $100 a day every day you don't drink it. All of a sudden, they're inspired. I have people come up. When I, I remember years ago, they said, well, I don't have time to volunteer. I said, what you have done is you have created a circumstance to where you now feel justified, to where you can't get involved in the local church or help your family even because you like busyness. Because busyness has become a great place to hide for you. Because you rather work two jobs, not that you need to, that you want to because you don't want to do what you're required to do. And that's take care of your family, be a good husband or be a good wife or whatever and a parent to your children and all this and be active in your local. So don't give me this stuff. They said, no, I'm really that busy. I said, I'll give you $50 for every service you volunteer in the next three months. You know what people, when's the service start? See, it's what motivates you. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? Don't give me the excuses you do this and do all that. I people come up and say, you know, I'm really tired today. I think I'm just going to go to bed. Oh, I got concert tickets. Oh, wait a minute. I'm starting to feel better now. 
Let me go take a shower. I think I'll feel a little bit better. That's what I need. I just need a shower and a cup of coffee. No. Verse 2, be not conformed to this world or this age. Now listen, this is one of the most important passages. Do not be conformed to this world or this age and fastened after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed and changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes. So that you may prove for yourself what is the good, prove for yourself, not everybody else. You ever notice you're supposed to run your own race? Don't go around telling everybody how to run their race. So that you may prove, you can be an example to other people. Encourage them. So that you may prove for yourself what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in His sight for you. Verse 3. And by the, by, for by the grace, unmerited favor of God, or in other words, God's ability given to me, I warn every one of you to not to estimate or think is that amazing? First one, body, first two and three, mind and think. Of himself more highly than he ought to. In other words, not to have an exaggerated opinion of your own importance, but to rate your ability with sober judgment according to, to the degree or the portion of, uh, by faith, portion by, uh, wait a minute, the degree of faith apportioned by God to him. Now we've all got the measure of faith. He didn't give Glenn 12 units and Pastor 14 and me three. He gave us all the. I, I preached this before. You know, I got a friend of mine that started out bench pressing 75 or 95 pounds. You think, well, I can do that. Yeah, but he ended up bench pressing 565 at the most. He didn't go to the gym the first day and say, oh, I got $12.41. How many muscles can I buy? <laughs> Why? But what we, we do that spiritually. We always ask God for something we have and try to become somebody we already are. We're always trying to become somebody we already are or ask God for what we, are, we already have. Can, can I give you a nugget? We're not the sick trying to get healed. We are the, actually the healed resisting sickness. We're not the poor trying to get rich. That means full supply lacking nothing. How would you like to give away more than you make and still get a tax refund? You say, well, I don't know how that works. Well, you're not operating in tithes and offerings then. You think you're great. See, a lot of people think they can do God's job better than what God can do for them. And technically, now I'm not saying you're going to go and go to hell, but technically you have fallen from grace. Everything we get from God is by grace through faith as we walk in love. Grace is God's ability. Well, you have a grace too. That's why when we go into a home, we say, come on now, let's be gracious to them. In other words, you have the ability to be nice. Let's give them the ability and the resources that we have to help them to where the, their grace has enough sufficiency to get them back on their feet. But the one thing about God's grace is it's always sufficient. Yes. 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 Yep. I'm 56 years old. And one thing I've learned about getting older is this. It's not confusing laziness with doing things smarter. I said, Lord, teach me how to do things smarter, not harder. I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I like to talk to older people. I sit down, and I, there's a gentleman that just passed away at 98 a while back. Um, uh, he his, he was started his first church May 7th, um, 1937. He started his church on November 21st, 1958, and he, re he stepped down from it nine years ago and went into the retirement center after his wife passed away. And he said, now listen, take, take the phone out, take the TV out. My purpose now is to pray until I die. Oh, I just went, God. Oh, I would call him. He goes, hello, Brother Todd. I said, and it, it, I found out that he used to come to eastern Kentucky in the 30s and 40s and do three and four, five, six, seven week revivals. Yeah. And a lot of my family got saved in those revivals. And a few years back, we calculated in full-time and part-time ministry of what sort. We had 18 members of our family, we think, in the ministry. And I believe it was the obedience of one man obeying the call of God and realizing it was by His grace through faith. And you say, I'm not important. You, you tell that Sunday school teacher that was retired that took that 
small group of boys. That it's, she's not important. Listen, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People come up to me and say, I have no friends. And I'm very blunt with people sometimes. I say, well, that's your fault. They say, well, see, you don't even like me. I said, no. I said, what you're doing is totally unscriptural. The Bible says in Proverbs, he who shows himself friendly makes friends. People say, well, I don't believe in healing. I said, fine, stay sick. Now, I got a new saying now. I don't believe in healing. I said, you ain't been sick long enough. I said, when you lay on the back, uh, hospital floor and you know how many rolls of tile it is to this way and over to this way and the, feel, the floor doesn't feel cold anymore. And you didn't even realize they put an IV in you when you was halfway asleep and it didn't hurt. When you throw up so much, you don't know if it's coming out which end. I'm going to be honest with you. Come on. You'll start believing something. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And I'll tell you what, it's either a lack of, ignor- uh, a lack of knowledge causing ignorance, or it's pride. People walk around, well, you know, my church. I don't care what your church, and I don't care what your denomination says. You show me in the Bible, then I will believe you. One of the biggest things I'm asked when I'm on a plane, well, what denomination are you? I said, I am of no denominations. There's too many of them. They said, what do you mean? I said, when I go overseas, they don't even know what you mean when you say Assembly of God or Presbyterian or Evangelical or Church of uh, Christ or whatever or Assemblies or, or Lutheran. They don't even know. I said, well, what are you? They said, all I know is Jesus came and set me free and healed my body. It's a mindset that we create and we box God. And God says, you can't box me. He creates the universe. From, he measures the universe from the end of his finger to the end of his thumb. By the span of the hand, God measures the universe. And it takes some of our capsules that we send out in our uh, missiles what, or whatever, our explanation. Three years flying. Almost at the speed of light, it seems like. Not the speed of light, but they're going hundreds of, of miles an hour. It takes them three years nonstop to get some places. And God goes, been there, done that. <laughs> Can I tell you, since we're on this, I, I'm not trying to take time. There, you know, there's a little dot between God's span of a hand, which measures the universe. It's so small, you have to get a microscope to see that, but God can see it perfectly little dot is called earth and you know what's inside not next to it but what's inside that little dot that's north america what's inside that little dot of that little dot that is united states of america what's within those three dots that's the great state the big bear state california amen whose phone is that i'm gonna answer it no i answer phones in service we have prayed for people before Oh, seriously, one lady, I said, here, who is it? She said, it's my daughter. And I said, what's her name? She said, well, who is this? I said, this is the preacher who was preaching when your phone rang on your mom's phone. And I'm trying to finish my sermon. She goes, I am so sorry. I said, that's okay. I believe in divine interruptions. I said, what do you need so we can pray for you about? She, her mom goes, she needs a job. I said, do you need a job? She goes, yeah, I need a job. I said, what's your first name? Cheryl. Okay, everybody, stretch your hands out for the phone. We're going to pray for Cheryl. She's crying now. (laughs) Happened twice in one church. Walked over and a lady came up and I said, who is this? It's my daughter. She said, well, who is this? I said, this is a preacher. Mom's phone went off. I was just preaching and your mom's phone went off and I just answered. She goes, oh, I'm sorry. I said, no, that's fine. I said, What's your name? Okay, do you need prayer for you? No, I'm fine. Is there anything you want me to relate to your mom? So I could tell her, because i got to go ahead and finish my sermon. She goes, well, just tell her to me to sit at the pizza shop after service. I almost said, well, why don't you come here, and then y'all can go together. I said, okay, is there anything else? Nope, all right, have a good day. All right, bye. Click, you need to meet your daughter at the pizza shop after church. How many knows you know those two people will never have their phone on again? It is... And when I, when I turned around and got back to the altar, it, it was in Gaston, Alabama. A big old truck driver guy was sitting there like this. 
His phone goes off. He goes, just hung it up. <laughs> I walked over. He goes, no, nope, I just hung it up. <laughs> Earth, North America, well, the United States of America, California, four of them. There's four dots within those. Do you know what's within those four dots? That's this county. You know what's within that, those dots? It's this city, Madeira. You know what's within that dot? That's this church. You know what's within that dot of 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 that dot? That's you. Now think about it. God's measure the universe in the span of the hand. So what's within, not next to it, but what's within that dot of 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 that dot? That's your big problem to God. So, our mindset? So, quit taking your problems to God. Just start taking your God to your problems. I like what Pastor Karen was. You don't really have problems. It's just that you don't apply the answers. Now here he said, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. One thing I've learned is this. One of the best ways to cast cares onto the Lord and release somebody from unforgiveness or hurt or whatever you may have against offense, the only one thing, it's the most effective thing. Your words affect both realms, spiritual and the natural, at the same time. He said, Lord, how do we pray to get days of heaven upon us? How do we pray the Lord's Prayer? He said, say this. So I'm learning that your voice is your address in the Spirit. If you don't speak, you lose by default. Yeah. So when a thought gets in your realm right here in the head, guess what? You say, nope, I'm not allowing that thought come in my mind because it does not line up according to the Word of God. Come on. If you, you used to go to the nightclubs and the bars and different things like that, and they had bouncers. You need to put Holy Ghost bouncers on your ears. <laughs> You say, well, i got these bad images. Well, quit watching the images. That's right. Amen? Amen? Come on. Yeah, come on. Yeah. We're eight images. Yeah. I mean, I can say Oakland Raiders or San Francisco Giants or 49ers. Everybody's got this. Some of you kind of went real silently. Yeah. Some of them went. <laughs> but you didn't express it, but it was in your what? Heart. But it started with your mind, which has images or your imagination. And So what we need to do is this. He said, don't think no more highly of yourself than you ought to, but think soberly according to the grace that was given to you. Well, the thing is, is he didn't think, say, don't think no more lowly of yourself than you ought to. You know, as long as I think and say what God's Word says about me, I'm not thinking no more highly of myself than I ought to. But the moment you overestimate your importance... No man is an island to himself. Lester Summerall said it the best, Dr. Lester Summerall. He said the banana that's away from the bunch is the one that gets spilled first every time. Can I tell you something? It's important for you to come here to church because the Bible says don't forsake the assembling yourself together, which is the habit of some believers. You need to come and hear the same word at the same time so you can get the same mindset. And you'll start believing the same thing. you start having the same thing. And suddenly it will start happening. This place right here called the Believer's Church of Madeira, in the natural, that's its name. But in the spirit, it's an epic center. Because yes. what happens here will shoot all over this county, in this region, in this area. And you think they're saying, well, you know what? This is not like a natural earthquake. Something's happening right here. We, 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 we tracked the whole county that we have not had one death in six months within 10 miles of this circumference, and right here is the Epic Center. They said, where is that? They said, it's the church right next to the bus station. That's right. How can you explain it? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Right. Come on, come on. Perfect peace. Whose mind is up on the Lord has perfect what? Peace. I think it's what, Isaiah 26.3 or something. So what I'm trying to say is this. It's not enough to renew your mind. You have to renew your will. What do I mean by that? You have to start choosing to make decisions based upon the knowledge your mind has been renewed to. Amen. In other words, act on what you believe. You've got to choose. A decision determines a direction, but a direction establishes a destiny. 
If I'm not mistaken, every degree you're off when you fly an airplane, every 100 miles, you're one mile off course. I don't want to guess at landing strips. God's given you a hope and a future. He's given you good success in your final outcome. God has a God-divine place that you're supposed to end up in life, just like Paul, where he stands up and says, Hey, I've kept the faith. I finished my course. I was not a spectator. I was a participator. And I finished. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. You want know keeps driving me to get up at four or something in the morning and keeps going all this and keeps going over here and working on Albania right now, working on Pakistan, working on Zambia right now and Greece again. And maybe, listen to this, maybe Kosovo. All these doors are opening up because why? I believe... I'm in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. It's not another notch in the belt. It's another mark that I'm trying to hit to finish my course. Each mark leads to another mark. I can't make a left and make a right on some streets. Because why? Because I can't make a left because I haven't made a right yet. But when I make a right, then the mark's down there for me to make the left. People are always, they don't even know how to... Uh, uh, read maps anymore. They got GPS. Well, you should get to the place where you don't even think about what, what your mind thinks because it's not your mind that God directs. It's your steps that He directs. Amen? And you need have this called, I call it the uh, God systeming positioning inside of you, called the Holy Ghost. When you get up, he said, I will lead you and guide you into all truth. I will do above and beyond what you can even dare ask or think or even imagine. I'm telling you folks, we limit God sometimes. I'm not saying I've arrived, but I'm telling you one thing I'm doing is I'm working on getting my thinking, my believing, and my speaking synchronized. And every thought that comes into my mind, I'm bringing it and saying, you better have chapter and verse before you enter into this establishment. Because if you don't, then you're kicked out. Let me hurry up. We're going into thinking. We've already done. Brother Hagin says you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Amen? Your mind, he said your mind stays as renewed as about as long as your hair stays combed. <laughs> James 1, 8 says a double-minded man is stable in all of his ways. The Amplified says that everything he thinks feels and decides. Mark 4, 24 and 25 says, Take heed to what you hear, for who has will be given, and who has not will be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. Faith comes by hearing, but also fear comes by hearing. But the difference is, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but fear comes and not by hearing the word of God. It's from another source. When you go up to people, you find out that you can do things with the English vernacular because of the mindset and the words that you speak that affects the way they believe and the way they act. You can take the word courage and you can do something positive and you can encourage somebody and add to them. Or you can say something bad from them and take away from that person and dis encourage them. When you go up to kids and say, hey, I got ice cream after service. They don't care who paid for it, what brand it is, how many sprinkles there are, what flavor. They just heard ice cream and it added something to them. But then there's times you can go up to people and say, listen, you need to sit down. I've got bad news. Why do I need to sit down? Because my words may take something away from you. You say, no, I, I'm going to stand. No, you need to sit down. I got bad news. What is it? So and so just passed away, and they almost fall in the floor. Nothing touched them or no person, but words yes. took touch them. Yes. That's why it's so important to watch what you say to children. Listen to me. People go up like demolition experts to children. Yes. There's times I got down in front of my little boy and I said, Dad's wrong. I shouldn't have said that. And the way, it's not what I said, son, it's the way I said it, and I was wrong. I got down on my knee. I said, look at me nice. Dad was wrong. The, the, the person I serve is never wrong. His name is Jesus. And I'm allowing Jesus to do a work in me. And we grab and we pray. We pray at, at night. Our family does. We just apply the button. We did it last night before we went to bed. We read a devotional. We pray and we go on. But the thing I'm learning is this. When you're a demolition expert with your words, especially with children, it takes no, no thought. No planning, no talent, and no ability. You just swing away and say, whatever happens. But I can't help it. Yes, you can. Amen. Next time you get angry, you go a day in jail. I bet you control your anger. 
You want me to tell you why some people can't control their anger? Because they're a controller and they're a bully until somebody bigger comes along with a worse problem. Then they're all of a sudden controlled. People who beat up people, then they stop it. Somebody else beats them. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? But I'm telling you, there's one thing that will solve the whole problem is love. Love never fails, but love is firm but gentle. Love speaks to, you've got to speak the truth in love. But what I've learned is allow the Holy Spirit to let me speak as He would speak. Think about what you're going to say. There's times I don't have time to think what I'm going to say, but I, especially with children. I'll see little kids. I seen a little kid the other day had a little girl, beautiful little girl, had pink glasses. They were round. They were prescription. She was about two years old. I walked up and I said, wow, I really like your glasses. And she looked up and grinned. I said, I really like that. I said, you know, I seen another little girl with uh, glasses just like yours and she had blonde hair too. The little girl just perked right up. You say, well, why did you do that? How many kids do you think teased her? How, you don't you think she's self-conscious? Yeah. I mean, this is new. She doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. All she needs is somebody to speak a positive thing. So every time, even if she doesn't remember my face, she remembers my words. Every time she puts those glasses on, wow, somebody thinks I look cool with these glasses on. You know, that child may grow up and be one of the biggest motivational speakers in the world. Come on. So be an architect with your words. Say one thing into a child's life and let somebody come along and put another pillar in there. Somebody put a cross beam. Somebody put it. First thing you know, you built a child with structure. Amen? Let me hurry here. I know some of you all praying and fasting. So why it's important to watch what you say. I'll give you two examples. Joshua 2, 9 and 11 and Joshua 5 and 1. This is your homework. Verse 9 and 11 is Rahab. She said unto the two men that came, you remember the two spies that came to, um, uh, I just, Jericho. They said, we know the Lord has given you land and your terror has fallen upon us. For as soon as we had heard what you do to the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the other side of Jordan, our hearts melted within us and neither did there remain any more courage. Take heed to what you hear for who has will be given and who has not will be taken. Words are very important and it will cause your believing to go stagnant. Romans chapter 10. Turn over to Romans chapter 10 real quick. I just got a couple more minutes. I'm almost done. Somebody said, yeah, I've heard that from preachers too. Praise the Lord. You, you know what it means when a preacher looks at his watch during the service? Absolutely nothing. Amen. <laughs> now listen, I want, I want to read this. Okay, now watch this. Are you all ready? We're talking about thinking, believing, speaking. Give me, who give me five more minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. That's all I need. No, I'm just teasing. Okay, listen to this. Here we go. Are you all ready? Okay, listen. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Watch this now. Let's go on down to verse 13 for time's sake. For whoever shall call confession upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and then shall he watch this how then shall he they call on him whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him who they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher verse 17 so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God that's why it's so important for you to come to church every chance you get. Listen, don't get me wrong. I know going to church doesn't make you a Christian. No more going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. You can fall asleep tonight in your garage. You will not wake up as a Ford F-350 or some Lexus or Cadillac. Going to church makes you a stronger Christian. Why? We're trying to get everybody to think, believe, and speak. Listen, have you ever been to Vegas, the old Vegas, where they had the champagne pyramid of glasses? You ever notice they only poured the champagne in one glass? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And it would overflow and it overflowed, 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 overflowed. Now listen, one thing I'm learning about ministers and stuff like this is it's not enough to uh, uh, respect them. You respect people with your words, but you honor people with your substance. Right. Yes. Yes. 
You can give them a card and buy them a bag of cookies and say, we love you. But when you give something to them that cost you something, you honor in them now. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because when I honor the gift, I get the provisions of the gift coming to me. The under shepherds of the great shepherd, God pours out upon them. And when they get filled, it pours out upon you. Now, I know we all have a personal relationship with God. The shepherds listen to the great shepherd. Are they perfect? No, nobody's perfect. Show me somebody. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? The word perfect in the Bible basically means mature. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this not because I'm just here, and I didn't plan to say this. But every time I come here, I leave better than when I come. A lot of times when I preach, I leave just exhausted. I feel like I'm a tool that has been dulled down because I've chiseled through stuff and done this. I'm not saying I'm perfect or I'm the answer. But when I leave here, I actually leave sharper. Amen. 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 And I'm going to say this. And I'm not too, listen, when they came to visit me, I honored them. I would not let them pay for anything. Why? Because it's not just them and their friendship. It's I'm representing and presenting myself to honor the gift of God. I didn't have to do that. I did it because I wanted to do something for them that cost my wife and I something. Because, listen, you can love people in word and in deed. I wanted to show, all those years they have done something for me, but they never came through. And every time they come through, I have it set up. You can call right now the Marriott where I live and talk to Linda. And she, I said, she said, what night do you need? I already have it set up. Direct billing. Anytime a minister comes through or somebody I know, it's a gift. Now, if you all show up at my house, you're going to stay at KOA. No, amen. No. Are you all seeing what I'm saying? I've learned people go, hey, I'm here, Brother Todd. I don't know who in the world you are. Amen. I'll give you a bag of cookies and a, a, a water. Amen. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, just find somebody you can honor. You know what I do with my mother? I honor my mother. My dad passed away when I was 15. But I honor, people go, well, I'm trying to work out and take these vitamins and do this regiment and I want to live a long life. Well, first commandment with promise is to honor your parents. And with long life. See, you've got to change the way you think. Come on. Okay, that's my little commercial there. Luke 8, 8 says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith upon the earth. We already know Romans 10, 9 and 10, 10. Listen, you cannot believe past what you don't uh, know. It's impossible. It's impossible. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, he said, Whoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he what? saith. One of the keys is believing. You can't say something that you don't know. And if you don't know it, then how can you believe it? Right. Amen. We having 2 Corinthians 4.13. Almost done. Promise. We have in the same spirit of faith according to it is written. I believe, therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. We know in Matthew chapter 12, 34, life and death are in the power of the tongue, out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. Amen. Yeah. Listen, if your seed is pure, then you better make sure your heart or the soil's pure and make sure the water or your words are pure so you can have it. Here's my last, my last point. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou shalt eat, mayeth eat, freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, one thing you've got to know is this. Eve was deceived, but Adam, by an act of his will, chose to do it. He says, shall surely die. He meant spiritually because Adam lived another, what, 900 years. My question to you is this. Where are you getting your knowledge from today? Are you getting smarter in the, in the system that is killing you and becoming more ignorant in the system that can save you, heal you, and deliver you? Don't get a stronghold from the wrong stuff. Or the tree of knowledge. When God says don't do this, don't do it. Don't choose to get your knowledge from another source. As you renew your mind, renew your will. If you're going to become brainwashed, wash your brain in the Word of God. Yeah. Purge your heart 
and put a guard about your lips. And don't Google everything. <laughs> now I'm being serious. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong. But the Bible says this. If you want true answers, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. Don't be, people say, well, I'm not trying to give place to the devil. That's the reaction. What's the action? Giving place to the Holy Spirit. When I draw nigh to you, I'm automatically resisting Him. You see what I'm saying? This action is producing a reaction. I don't sow money to reap. I sow money because I believe God's already blessed me. So I release out of my life so God can increase back into my life. I don't confess to get God to do something. I confess it because I believe He's already done it. I believe, therefore I speak. So when you start having symptoms or you're diagnosed with something, don't go to WebMD or go all this and look up all the facts. Go to the truth. For the truth will set you free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Did y'all get anything out of this? Amen. Have you ever hit your thumb with a hammer? Do you put the hammer down real calmly and just sit there and go, wow. <laughs> now what do you do? You, you throw the hammer without what? And you say something you hope is good, let's be real. Without what? Thinking about it. Now I'm going to tell you this real quick. I know, I know some of you got trust me, you don't want to get to a restaurant early on Sundays. I already told you this. I worked at them for seven, nine years, I forget. One thing we never did at a restaurant was run out of food on Saturday night. Saturday night's one of your biggest nights. Never ran out of food. So who ate leftovers Sunday morning? People who didn't go to church got up early. Or people who got out early out of church. Especially buffets. I'm serious. Didn't put the good stuff out to about one. No, I'm serious. You're thinking, oh my God. So people come out and they go, hey, pa hey, we've already been to church and ate. I said, I hope you ate three plates. <laughs> but you want to really say what Brother Hagin said. Bless your darling heart and your stupid head. No. <laughs> no. They paid for the same amount for leftovers and we get the good stuff. They basically cleaned the buffet out and then we're going to go buffet our bodies. I'm going I'm to just say this. I have people come up to me, and there's been times I thought people, I was going to have to fly back to be in a court case or something. People go, I need to talk to you. I said, what's going on? I, I come here, I, go, it's just, I, I really got to tell you this. I honestly think they're going to confess to a homicide. <laughs> I'm thinking, great, now I got to come back for a witness and all this. You know what it is most of the time? I'm a backslider. I go... I said, well, slide back. <laughs> you mean it's that easy? I said, yeah. I said, your worst enemy is you. You're living under condemnation, guilt, and shame. Right. I mean, you've been digging a ditch and ended up being a coffin. Yep. Then there's some people that's never accepted the Lord because they know all about God and Christianity. And, and I mean, they're a, a what's, what do they call it? I, I, I'm a learned individual. I've studied all denominations and all religions of all sorts and, and I know about the Hindu and the Muslim and, and all the different beliefs and all this and this and I said, here, I said, have you ever peeled an orange? Get them to peel an orange sometimes and section it and you eat it in front of them. It's amazing, they'll have all the orange stains and the peelings and maybe a couple of seeds and boy, they really smell like an orange. But they cannot tell you if that orange was sweet or sour because they never ate it for themselves. The Bible says, taste of God and see how good He is. I believe there's some people watching by live streaming right now that needs to get right back with the Lord. The third thing I'm going to ask you to do is this. You've never been saved. You're a backslider. Some of you need to recommit your life. You don't want to be lukewarm on the day of judgment. Some of you think, think you're a participator, but you haven't done something in so long that you've actually went under the ropes and you've been watching the race for so long, you think you're running while you've actually been watching. That's why you're not on course. 
I don't know who you are. I'm not your judge. All I'm doing is giving you or presenting an opportunity for you to get back in the race because you're not disqualified yet. God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? He gave the best thing he ever had to sow it into the earth to reap the best thing the earth offered is you and I. He died that he could produce a harvest through us. I'm going to tell you, the days ahead of you are a lot better than the days behind you. But you've got to recalculate today. Collaborate, whatever you want to do. You've got to come to a reasoning to yourself to where you consider him and acknowledge him in all your ways. And if you say, well, I don't need it because I'm satisfied, I'll tell you what the Lord told me. You're selfish. He said, because what I'm trying to do to you and through you is not always for you. It's for the people around you. God has me to do certain things I don't want to do. and you know. But I've chose to not just do it as an act of obedience, but a submission of the willingness in my heart. Because I realize he's trying to bring me into people's lives as he's bringing them into mine. So what I'm, my will is not really to run my race. It's to encourage everybody else to run theirs. And in turn, we all finish. Maybe at a different time, but we finish. There's one thing I'm striving for, folks. I, I still remember sitting last year out in the desert in Egypt between Cairo and Alexandria. It was cold. I could see my breath. I started thinking about my little boy and my wife. Seven thousand, almost 7,100 miles away. I thought, wow. And the Lord just reminded me, son, if I could send my son from heaven to earth, I can send you from Colorado to Egypt. And he reminded me, of those words, he says, stay on course. Because one day, you'll hear them. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys that have been prepared for you. Your life is a vapor. God is not interested in your resume. He's not interested in any letters or recommendations. It's not what we did in life. I don't believe we'll be judged on it. It's compared to what we were called to do to affect other people's lives. So if you've never been saved, you're a backslider, or you need to recommit your life publicly. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. He said, well, I'm going to heaven. I didn't say that. I said, recommit your life. Get back in the race, recommit yourself, and get your GPS hooked back up online. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. If you look around, you won't do it because you'll be a spectator if you just turn around and look. You already know you need to do this. So whether you're the only one or everybody, it doesn't matter. You have already made the decision. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to raise my hand and say, I need to do this today. Not just for me, but for everybody that God uses me to reach. There's people you'll never know that you impacted their life until you get to heaven. That's why it's so important for you to run your race because people are always watching. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, but they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. How's that possible? It's not you that liveth Christ in you, the hope of glory. On three, if you've never been saved, you're a backslider, or you want to publicly recommit your life and get it back on track to be about the Father's business. I want you to raise your hand on three. Ready? One, two, three. Just raise it up. Now I'm going to do it one more time. Put your hands down. If you all raised your, raised your hand the first time, I don't want you to do it the second time. But if you think, oh, I should have done that, I'm going to give you one more chance on three. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now. Now, if you raise your hand on any of those, I want you to stand up and come down here. If you think about it, you won't do it. Just stand up and come down here right now. Right now, just come up. Just do it. Just like hitting your hammer, thumb with a hammer. Just come down here. Right now. Come on, more hands that went up. Come on, there was more hands that went up. Now I want you to look to the right and I want you to look to your left and say, if you wanted to go down but you don't want to go down by yourself, I will go down. Turn and look at somebody right now. We did this in Farmington, New Mexico and 13 more people came down. One of them was a big guy and I told this story before. He's a real tall guy. He looked like he should have been on GQ magazine. He, I don't say this about guys, but he, he looks sharp. 
he had a little Native American girl that was about half the size as her, but real little, little pigtails. You ever seen Monsters, Inc., that little girl named Boo? It was her, Native American. This guy was so big, she only had one of his fingers. And the stage was so high up, that morning we had 30 some people, I think, come down to the Lord. I looked over and I said, sir, does she understand why she's coming down? And he said, he went like this. So I'm about ready to come down. He goes, no, I'm not bringing her. She's bringing me. And she's just sitting there the whole time. I led him to the Lord, met him out in the lobby. He's still, she's still sitting there going. He's changed. Anybody else? Whosoever will, let him come. Anybody else? Now, I want everybody, I'm going to throw the net right now. I want everybody to say this prayer together. I want everybody up here in the front, close your eyes. I want you to say it out loud. Believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth. Say, Father. Father. Come on, even the Raiders are moving. We're more excited about that. <laughs> say, Father. Father. I come to you now. Come just, as I am. just as I am. No excuses. No justifications. No negotiations. Here am I. I ask you to forgive me of my sins as I repent or turn from my sins I turn towards you I ask you to do something for me that I can't do for myself get my life back on track be my savior be my lord so therefore as I believe in my heart I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord, and that God, as He raised Him up, He will come back for me and raise me up. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to be my GPS, to teach me and to guide me in all truths. And when I mess up, teach me how to recalculate not to run from you, but to run back towards you. I make a recommitment of my life. Lord, forgive me for being selfish. Teach me to acknowledge you and what I need to do in my life. Let me let my light shine before men so they may glorify you. So this day, I choose to put my hand to the plow and not look back because I believe my future looks a lot better than my past. Father, in the name of Jesus, I commit myself to you. I know you'll never leave me and you'll never forsake me, but give me the strength to do the same to you. In Jesus' name. Now raise your hand. Raise your hand as Pastor John comes or Pastor Mike. Let's acknowledge him and thank him today for what he has done. Father, not one perish. I believe that lives, not just these lives, but generations of generations of lives have been changed. Not just through our thinking, believing, and our speaking, but by the act of our will to choose today to serve God.